there are a lot of points I want to make tonight, but uh, the most important one is that uh, 20 years ago I became the luckiest man on earth because Michelle Obama agreed to marry me. And so uh, I just want to wish, uh, sweetie, uh, you happy anniversary and let you know that a year from now we will not be celebrating it in front of 40 million people. Uh, you know, four years ago, we went through uh, the worst financial crisis since the Great Depression. Millions of jobs were lost. The auto industry was on uh, the brink of collapse. Uh, the financial system had frozen up. And because of the resilience and the determination of the American people, uh, we've begun to fight our way back. Uh, over the last 30 months, we've seen 5 million jobs in the private sector created. Uh, the auto industry has come roaring back. And housing. Uh, has begun to rise. But we all know that we've still got a lot of work to do. And so the question here tonight is not uh, where we've been, but where we're going. Uh, Governor Romney uh, has a perspective that says uh, if we cut taxes, skew towards the wealthy, and roll back regulations, that uh, we'll be better off. I've got a different view. I think we've got to invest in education and training. I think it's important for us to develop new sources of energy here in America that we change our tax code to make sure that we're helping small businesses and companies that are investing here in the United States, that uh, we take some of the money that we're saving as we wind down uh, two wars uh, to rebuild America, and that we reduce our deficit in a balanced way that allows us to make these critical investments. Now, it ultimately, it's going to be up to the voters, to you, uh, which path we should take. Uh, are we going to double down on the top-down economic policies that help to get us into this mess? or? Do we embrace a new economic patriotism that says America does best when the middle class does best? And I'm looking forward to having that debate. I'm Congressman Ron Paul, a congressman from Texas. I am the defender of the Constitution. I'm the champion of liberty. This shows the roadmap to peace and prosperity. Yes, we need more regulations on the politicians and on the bureaucrats. That's where they are. The idea that the government was over-regulating, everybody felt like the government would take care of them and that housing bubbles could last forever and there was a moral hazard to it. If you have a free market, there's plenty of regulations. The regulations are that if you don't do a good job and you don't serve the consumers, the consumers don't buy the products and they go bankrupt and they go out of business. That's a pretty strong regulation. Regulation, follow up your contracts. If you break your contract, you're in big trouble. If you hurt the environment, you're in big trouble because you're violating somebody else's property. So there's a lot of very strict regulations in a free market economy. But this whole idea of earmarking, earmarking is designated how the money is spent. What a lot of people don't understand is if, if the Congress doesn't say the way the money should be spent, it goes to the executive branch. And that's the bad part. If you were actually cutting, it would make a difference. But you don't want to give more power to the executive branch. Even if I'm president, I don't want more power over that, over that funding. That should be with the people and, and with the Congress. But earmarking... Uh, the reason we get into trouble is, is the irresponsibility of Congress. Take your highway funds. We're supposed to pay a user fee. We pay our gasoline tax. We should get our fair share back. But what do they do? They take the highway funds and other these trust funds, and they spend this money overseas in these wars that we shouldn't be fighting. And then when the highways need building, then you have to go and fight the political system and know who to deal with and maneuver and try to get some of your money back. But if you say you're against, uh, in, in, against the earmarking and fuss and fume over, the answer is vote against the bill. That is what I do. I argue for the case of the responsibility of being on the Congress, but it's the responsibility of us who believe in fiscal conservatism to vote against the bill. We need a vote against the spending is what we need to do. Well, uh, let me talk specifically about what I think we need to do. Uh, first, we've got to improve our education system. And we've made enormous progress drawing on ideas both from Democrats and Republicans. Uh, that are already starting to show gains in some of the toughest to deal with schools. Uh, we've got a program called Race to the Top that uh, has prompted reforms in 46 states around the country, raising standards, improving how we train teachers. So now I want to hire another 100,000 uh, new math and science teachers and create 2 million more slots in our community colleges so that people can get trained for the jobs that are out there right now. And I want to make sure that we keep uh, tuition low. For our young people. If you care about your children, you'll get the federal government out of the business of educating our kids. 
1980, when uh, the Republican Party ran, uh, part of the platform was to get rid of the Department of Education. By the year 2000, it was eliminated, and we fed on to it. Then we, as Republicans, added no child left behind. So the first thing a president should do is that the goal should be set to get the government out completely, but don't enforce this law of no child left behind. It's not going to do any good, and nobody likes it, and, and there's no value to it. The teachers don't like it, and the students don't like it. But there are other things that the federal government can do, and that is give tax credits for the people who will opt out. We ought to have a right to opt out of the public system if you want. We can't afford government spending money on these things because the government is flat out broke and they've bankrupted our country. So if we had less government and let the people produce, we're not producers anymore. Productive jobs have gone overseas and all we have is debt. And then to argue that we need more money for Pell Grants, well, we don't have any money. There's no more people to steal it from and you just can't keep printing the money. So sure, it's a grand, great uh, idea to have Pell Grants and all these wonderful things, but the, the real truth truth is that you have less of it if you depend on the government to do it and you should depend on free people taking care of themselves and you would see so much more prosperity, so much better education, so much better transportation. The, the first role of the federal government is to keep the American people safe. Uh, that's its most basic function and uh, as commander in chief uh, that is something that uh, I have uh, worked on and thought about every single day that I've been in the Oval Office. But I also believe that government has the capacity, the federal government has the capacity to help open up opportunity and create ladders of opportunity and to create frameworks where the American people can succeed. Look, the genius of America is the free enterprise system and uh, freedom and the fact that people uh, can go out there and start a business, uh, uh, work on an idea, uh, make their own decisions. But uh, as Abraham Lincoln understood, there are also some things we do better together. So in the middle of the Civil War, Abraham Lincoln uh, said, let's help to finance the Transcontinental Railroad. Let's start the National Academy of Sciences. Let's uh, start land-grant colleges because we want to give these gateways of opportunity for all Americans because if all Americans are getting opportunity, we're all going to be better off. That doesn't restrict people's freedom. That enhances it. And so what I've tried to do uh, as president is to apply those same principles. And of course, uh, just recently, we have had some other changes. Matter of fact, early uh, this, this year, the president announced a policy change. He said now that it was proper uh, with his, uh, w w it was proper for him to have the authority to assassinate an American citizen even if they have not been charged with anything if he thought it was necessary. <laughs> very bad. Now, of course, the person they picked out, probably a very bad guy, he talked about stirring up violence. He was never charged with it. He never had a trial, and yet, it was decided that he would be assassinated, so we used a, a uh, drone and we assassinated him in Yemen. So let it go by. He's a bad guy. He's gone. But the principle, the precedent is very, very dangerous. So the next week, they decided, well, his son looked like a pretty uh, shady character too, so they sent another missile over to get the son. Well, they got him, plus his, plus his cousin. They were back in the backyard barbecuing, killed them both. The son was 16 years old, and this, this is not the way America is supposed to be. We're supposed to be a nation of law, a rule of law is what we want. In one sense, when we go into the military, we take the oath and we go and fight and, and endanger ourselves to protect our Constitution. At the same time, our Constitution is being eroded right here at home. Just this last week, two weeks ago, I guess, the National Defense Authorization Act that act has in it. I'm always impressed that so many people know about it. That means we have a healthy society and the internet is working. But that bill essentially eliminates posse comitatus. It's institutionalizing military law that the military can arrest an American citizen without charges and being denied an attorney and, can't, and held indefinitely even in a foreign prison. 
This, this is not good for us. Uh, and I want to thank the Uni University of Denver. Uh, you know, uh, four years ago, uh, we were going through a, a major crisis. Uh, and yet, uh, my faith and confidence in the American uh, future is undiminished. And the reason is because of its people. Because the woman I met in North Carolina who decided at 55 to go back to school because she wanted to inspire her daughter and now has a job from that new training that she's gotten. Because a company in Minnesota who was uh, willing to give up salaries and perks for their executives to make sure that they didn't lay off workers during a recession. Uh, the auto workers that you meet in Toledo or Detroit take such pride in building the best cars in the world, not just because of paycheck but because it gives them that sense of pride that they're helping to build America. And so the question now is how do we build on those strengths? And everything that I've tried to do and everything that I'm now proposing for the next four years in terms of improving our education system or developing uh, American energy or making sure that we're closing loopholes for companies that are shipping jobs overseas and focusing on small business companies that are creating jobs here in the United States or, or closing our deficit in a responsible, balanced way that allows us to invest in our future. All those things are designed to make sure that the American people, their genius, their grit, their determination uh, is, is channeled and, 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 and they have an opportunity to succeed. And everybody's getting a fair shot and everybody's getting a fair share. Everybody's doing a fair share and everybody's playing by the same rules. You know, four years ago, uh, I said that I'm not a perfect man and I wouldn't be a perfect president. And that's probably a promise that Governor Romney thinks I've kept. But I also promised that I'd fight every single day on behalf of the American people and the middle class and all those who are striving to get in the middle class. I've kept that promise. And if you'll vote for me, uh, then I promise I'll fight just as hard in a second term. Well, most of the things the federal government could do to get us back to work is get out of the way. I'd like to donate. <laughs> I'd like to see the uh, federal government have a sound currency. That creates a healthy economy. I, I would like to uh, see massive reduction of uh, regulations. I would like to see income tax reduced as, to near zero a, as possible. And that is what we have to do. We have to get the government out of the way. We have to recognize why we have unemployment. And it comes because we have a deeply flawed financial system that causes financial bubbles. The bubbles burst and you have the unemployment. Now, the most important thing to get over that hump that was created artificially by bad economic policies is to allow the correction to occur. You have to get rid of the excessive debt. You have to get rid of the malinvestment. And you don't do that by buying the debt off, off the people who, who were benefiting from it. So we, the people, shouldn't be stuffed with, stuck with these debts on these mortgage derivatives and all. We need to get that behind us, which means the government shouldn't be doing any bailout. So most of the things to improve the environment is getting the government out of the way and enforce contract laws and enforce bankruptcy laws. Yes, but he makes the assumption it wouldn't have happened unless government did this. They say that, and the, quite frankly, there would probably be more funds for innovation than if the government uses the innovations and passes out the funds for political reasons. The funds would be spent in the marketplace by supply and demand, reward the success, and punish the inefficient. And that would be much better than with the government doing it. Case. First, I don't like the idea that you have good, good bailouts and bad bailouts. If bailouts are bad, they're bad, and we shouldn't be doing it. But this argument uh, about maybe one that works, you know, well, now uh, that the uh, bank bankruptcy or the bailing out of uh, GM worked, I said that's sort of like uh, if a criminal goes out and robs a bank and he's successful, therefore you endorse what he did because he's successful. But you have to rob people. You have to distort the law. The government is supposed to protect contracts. They're not supposed to regulate contracts, and they're not supposed to undermine contracts. And that's what we've been doing. In the housing bubble, we undermine contracts. And this is what we're doing here. So you want to respect the contracts. A lot of people will accuse me of, of advocating a free market, that there's no regulations. Actually, the regulations are tougher because you have to go through bankruptcy and, and you have to face up to this. And it isn't like General Motors would be destroyed. Newt made that point there, that there were good parts of General Motors. But, but politicians can't figure this out. Then they serve the special interest. And then you have labor fighting big business. I opt uh, for the the uh, free market and the defense of liberty. That's what we need in this country. <laughs> All right.